So, without further ado, I ask you to unmute yourself, Dave Rowe. How are you? This is Dave Rowe down here at the bottom. Good evening, Dave. Hello, Hello everyone. How are you? I'm doing all right. How are, uh, how are you guys this evening? Good. Good. Everybody's doing fine. Uh, I'm going to make you a co-host, Dave, right now. Okay. And uh, you can take care to work on this. Uh, Dave is supervisor at the Fitchburg chapter, not chapter, division of uh, the Wisconsin DNR up there. And uh, Dave's going to talk about what you see right now. Status and direction of Southwest wild trout management and populations and management. So, wow, that's a funny looking trout, Dave. It's not a trout, but <laughs> big sturgeon. Big sturgeon. I know what so, that is. That's good. Um, so does my screen look right? It's not the preview screen, right? It's the, the, the big. Looks good. Looks good. Wonderful. Yeah, well, great. thanks. Thanks for having me tonight. Um, and I'm excited to talk about this because uh, one, I love talking about my work and two, um, trout is, is, is uh, one of my favorite fish to, to catch too. Um, the sturgeon on the picture I'm holding there is uh, something we did about two weeks ago. We were actually um, hook and line angling for juvenile sturgeon. Uh, and most of the fish we caught were 24 to 30 inches. And we were pit tagging them on the lower Wisconsin river, but I happened to hook into a 55 incher and actually landed it, which was pretty uh, fun. So uh, I thought I'd show that picture. Um, what I'm going to talk about today um, is start talking a little bit about who uh, my staff is on my team um, for the Fitchburg area and what, air, what counties we cover in southwest Wisconsin. Um, kind of how we've changed how we do some of our trout population assessments, looking more at a watershed scale than just looking at a stream to stream um, idea. Um, and that'll get us into talking a little bit about um, some of our um, recent efforts to try to focus on brook trout um, protection and restoration because our brook trout seem to be slowly slipping away uh, as brown trout become dominant in some of our streams. Um, and then uh, talk a little bit about um, how your trout stamp dollars, if you buy a Wisconsin license, get spent uh, managing the habitat and some of our property management stuff some of the collaborations we have with you guys and other Trout Unlimited chapters and some of our property management stuff. And then I'll end a little bit with plugging some of the reports that we've got online for um, the, the status of these different watersheds and, and recent data on them that, where you guys can go find the data. So um, one of the offices that is in my team is the Point Ed office. And so if you've gone up to Sauk and Columbia counties, uh, you know, straight north of Madison. Um, it's got some pretty nice resources. Um, uh, the biologist is Nate and I, and Nate gave some really nice talks over the winter last winter to the Southern chapter, and they put those on their website. So you can see some of his watershed reports in a webinar format. And then his um, technician is Casey Weber. Um, Rowan Creek is a wonderful stream in their area, Lodi Spring Creek, Dell Creek. Um, and Basically, uh, it's the Wisconsin River divides those two counties, and then to the west is the Driftless in Sauk County. But uh, in Columbia County, it's it's non uh, it is glaciated area. Uh, in uh, another of the offices is Dodgeville, um, so to the to our southwest, um, we have two biologists and technician teams that are actually out of the Dodgeville office. The first is uh, what was formerly Brad Sims' position. Brad. Uh, if you haven't heard, has left his fish biologist job and has taken a uh, policy biologist job in our central office and is now our rivers and streams coordinator for the state of Wisconsin. So it was a great uh, promotional great. opportunity for Brad. And he is now, it, it was what we would call our old trout coordinator job, which was Joanna Griffin or Larry Claggett before that. And um, with some added responsibilities for rivers. And so they've changed the name of the job just from our trout coordinator to our rivers and streams coordinator. And Brad took that job. And, and we're really lucky that his wealth of experience and knowledge from working in the Southwest, both with the lower Wisconsin Riverway and all the trout streams, um, is going gonna, is gonna to benefit the whole state now, which is fantastic. So I've got a, a vacancy in that position for Brad's position, but we're working on hiring it. I, I spent my whole day today uh, doing interviews for people to replace Brad. Uh, and then Brad's technician is uh, Dan Walchek, and Dan Walchek actually came 
through our research um, Office of Applied Sciences and Research and was a long term LTE there uh, and and knows our resources really well and um, he loves the the lower Wisconsin River he's got a, a greater river red horse there is, that he's holding up. Um, but basically the, the, that office covers Grant County uh, and Lafayette County in the lower Wisconsin Riverway. Um, many of you may know Justin Hagelin. Justin is our biologist in the, the northern two counties out of the Dodgeville office. So it's Richland County and Iowa County, a lot of trout water in Justin's area. Uh, Justin actually was the acting uh, trout coordinator for the last year and a half while we were in between Joanna Griffin and Hiring Brad. Uh, he and Kirk Olson from uh, La Crosse co-led the, the trout team and uh, we're, we're doing that stuff in the absence of a, a coordinator. Uh, but Justin is a wealth of knowledge on trout, uh, really lucky to hire him a couple of years ago. Uh, and Lloyd Meng is his technician. Uh, Lloyd's holding a nice tiger trout there that came out of one of their area streams. Uh, and Justin and Lloyd actually have a real a cool project going on the West Branch of the Pine River, uh, looking with pit tag arrays and looking at um, movement in and out of a special regulation section of the West Branch of the Pine and following trout movement uh, throughout the year to see on a stream where you have different regulation sections, how much do the fish move in and out of those different regulations. So that's a real neat ongoing project those two guys have. And then the last office I supervise is the Fitchburg office. So that's uh, suburban uh, Madison and uh, we cover Dane County, Greene County and Rock County. So Black Earth Creek, Mount Vernon, some of the near Madison streams, uh, Dan gets to cover and Dan Ole, um, same thing, he actually came out of our Office of Research too. Um, so did Justin Hagelin actually, so a lot of us, and actually my hit, my past came, I was a technician at research 20 years ago. And so a lot of my team um, maybe uh, followed in the same path of starting at research and then moving into fish management. Uh, but we uh, recently lost our technician in the Madison office because he also promoted and took uh, the statewide electrofishing coordinator position. And so he works mostly now building uh, electrofishing boats and stream barges and backpack shockers. And so we're going to have to replace Andrew Notbaum, who was in that position um, for a while. So that's my team. Um, how do we assess our trout populations? When you, know, you guys hear us talk about surveys all the time, this is the standard gear we use. And it's normally a three-person crew. Um, on that little toad barge behind the third person is a generator. The generator creates um, AC electrical current. So it's going, it's alternating current going back and forth. It goes into a control box that actually turns it into direct current. So the uh, current is flowing just in one direction, which causes the fish to be attracted to those anodes. So those probes the guys are holding, the electricity actually flows out of those. And then there's a, a cathode on the bottom of the boat, but the fish follow into the electrodes. And so it kind of attracts them and brings them into there because it's, it's direct current and the fish flow swim into the current. Once they get close enough, then they actually get shocked and they'll turn on their side and the guys can dip them and put them in a little tub. And then once they're out of the electrical current, they come back and they uh, re revive. And luckily fish have a different heart structure than, than humans do. And so there's no pacemaker cells. So if a fish gets shocked, it doesn't send its heart into a, a defibrillar, uh, a fib fibrillation pattern of, of, of vibrating and quivering. It, it'll, it'll shut down, uh, but then it'll start beating again. And the, the, the fish come back usually within about a minute or so, and we don't have to worry about uh, killing them uh, unless we use a, a, a really high voltage and, and we know not to do that. We know our, our waters and the conductivity. So we can sample pretty effectively in our, our streams using these uh, small pieces of equipment. Um, if we are on a really small stream, then instead of using a generator, we actually use a battery. And um, the new backpacks actually have lithium ion batteries. And so they're really nice and light and we can go far and we still get enough electricity out of them to shock the fish and collect them. And then we put them in a bucket and weigh them. And so most of our trout assessments, when we talk about the, the catch, we, we, we do a real simple uh, um, calculation of how many fish per length of stream. And so when you see the numbers I'll present, it's numbers per mile of stream. And so if we were to shock you know, a quarter of a mile and we would catch 100 fish, 
times four to get up to a full mile, we'd say, well, 400 fish per mile. So it's real, real simple. It's just the number of fish per distance that we catch over with, with the electric fishing gear. Our nine counties, so we, I talked, kind of went through the teams and the offices, are the nine counties of Southwest Wisconsin that we cover um, from Columbia and Sauk in the top to Grant Lafayette in the bottom, um, Richland, Iowa, Green, Dane, and Rock. Um, all these are the watersheds that we've grouped our trout streams into. And so it makes sense to think about a uh, watershed, right? Because all the things that fall in that watershed come into the stream and, and go downstream and they're all connected. And so we, we, we started to realize that kind of the, a scattershot approach to monitoring our streams and not looking at the streams that are connected wasn't, wasn't really a, a good way to do it. But we also worried if we just looked at each watershed per year or something like that, we would, we would miss out something that was happening over the whole area. And so the red dots that are sprinkled throughout those watersheds are the trend sites that we sample every year. We go back there every year so we can get annual trends throughout the whole area, even though now we assess one of those watershed groups at a time um, in a six year rotation. And so we started this actually in 2013 as an experimental method and it worked out really well. And so now we've actually, the whole area, we, we each of these, each biologist has usually about one or two of these watershed groups that they sample intensively and look at the watershed. But we also continue to, to look at those annual trend sites to, to look at are there trends over time throughout the watersheds. Um, I'll tell you at the end and I'll, I'll, where you can find the reports and every year as we do these watershed reports we've been publishing the data and our recommendations and kind of a management plan for each of these watershed groups. Um, so what, what I told you that we look at the, the fish abundance over a linear distance and so when I show you a graph like this the x-axis down on the bottom, that's time. So 2008, 2009, all the way up to 2018. Um, we didn't collect much data in 2020 because of some COVID restrictions. And the 2021 data is too fresh. And I thought, well, if I'm not going to add those other years, I'm not going to go get 2019. So uh, the data that I'm going to show you is up to 2018. There are four lines on there. And each of those lines represents a size group. So the bottom line, the orange line, is the fish that are bigger than 12. And then the next line up is the fish that are bigger than 8. And so they're, they're cumulative as we go up here. And then the next line up, that is the fish that are bigger than 4. And then the top line is all, all trout total. So if you were going to look at 2011, we had almost 1,300 brown trout per mile as an average in all of our trend streams. And so we averaged all those different trend streams to kind of get these regional trends. And you can see following 2010, we had a real, uh, an increase over the whole region in trout abundance and trout reproduction. And so those little guys, the fish that are between zero and four, there was a lot of new fish coming in, but really the, the, the 12 inches of the big fish stayed pretty, pretty steady. And you'll see that in a lot of our trout data that the, the older fish, the numbers seem pretty steady, but the younger fish can go bounce up and down and there's a lot of variability that comes in there. The, 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 the Y axis there is the number per mile. And so that's the response. So um, that 2010 peak, we had a lot of fish. And then the 2012, we had a drought, really hot summer, really low stream flows, and then followed up by really cold winters in 2013 and 2014. And so as the region, the whole, the whole area, we saw trout numbers drop off as some of those younger fish really had a hard time surviving in either low flows and cold winter conditions. Um, the bigger fish seemed to survive fine. Like we didn't see a depression at all in the larger fish, but the smaller fish, we saw that. We saw a bounce back in 2015 and 2016. Um, 2019, uh, even though the data is not on here, we did see a, a, a drop and we think it was to do with a lot of the flooding that we had in 2018 in the winter. And so the, the fish probably uh, spawning and, and reproduction was impacted, but I can tell you from just what we've been doing 2020 and 2021, those numbers have bounced back up again. So we see these environmental regional influences affect the trout abundance. Um, and those different size classes we chose because 
the zero to four inch group is the young of the year fish or the fish that were spawned the previous fall. The fish that are larger than four but smaller than eight, we would call those our yearling fish and they're about one year old size. That eight inch boundary is, is kind of fuzzy and it's not as clean as an age break for the, the, the age zero or young of the year fish, but it's still a pretty good representation. And then because our size limit is eight as well, uh, most of our streams, that makes a good definition of what makes an adult trout. So that, that, that blue line, the first blue line is all trout and, and the difference between the blue and the green is the young of the year, the yearling, the adult trout, and then 12 would be our quality trout. And so it, it actually is a pretty neat, just simple size description that gets both age structure as well as the quality of the fishery. This is the brown trout data from all of those regional trend sites through the last 10 years. This is the brook trout data over those same sites over the same time. And you'll see a lot different pattern, right? You see a higher abundance in the, the late 2000s and then dropping down and staying steady. But even those adult size are dropping down. And so with, with the brook trout numbers, Again, we see some variability, but we don't see that same pattern that we do with the brown trout of, of, of actually increasing with some environmental variability. We see more of a slow and steady decrease in the brook trout. And we'll talk a little bit about brook trout going forward. Um, how do we do our watershed assessments and why is it important to do a watershed assessment? Well, um, if you can see the map here, this is Mill Creek in Richland County. Some of the stream segments are colored green and some of the stream segments are colored blue. The blue ones are class two trout streams and the green ones are class one trout streams. So in Wisconsin, we define our, our trout classes as class ones are streams that have um, lots of reproduction, plenty of recruitment, plenty of adults, don't need any stocking to sustain a trout population, or can be places that have at least uh, good yearling and uh, good, good young of the year. So those small fish and at least one or two yearlings so we know places that have natural reproduction. They may not actually be a great fishery, but we know that it's got a lot of importance for natural reproduction because it's got a lot of small fish uh, and some yearlings. Um, so those are class one streams. Our class two streams are streams that are thought of as, yes, they can support trout year round, the trout survive, but there may be some limitations to the natural reproduction and recruitment. And so they probably need to be stocked to meet their full potential. And so um, when I came on as the supervisor for the team in 2010, one of the things that the biologist said a lot was, well, you know, we really need to look at this because we think a lot of the streams that were class two streams really are functioning as class one streams because we think even when we don't stock them, there's plenty of fish there. And with the habitat work, with the water quality improvements, with the land use changes, we, we think we're getting a lot more natural reproduction than we, we think we are. So what we did was we took that watershed approach to our sampling and the year prior to the scheduled surveys, we, we suspended all stocking in the whole watershed. The idea there is that the following year, you see those four to eight inch fish, which are yearling fish. We know they had to come from somewhere within the watershed. They weren't stocked. And so even though they may not come from this, you never see those little young of the year, those little four inchers, you still know that somewhere in the watershed, the trout was born naturally and then migrated down to the main stem of the stream. And so we really were interested in saying, okay, well, if we, we pause stocking for a year, we come back the following year, do we find yearling fish? And so we did that at a watershed approach to assess whether our streams are class one or class two. Um, and this map is from 2013 and you'll see some of the streams didn't get sampled. Now, when we do a watershed, we make sure that all the, all the streams in the watershed get sampled during that rotation year. And so this is what the data looks like from, from that 2013 sampling of Mill Creek watershed. So again, I told you that the important thing that we're really looking for is those four to seven inch fish. So the fish that would be the evidence that the previous year fish had spawned and, or, and, or two, two winters previous, we had natural reproduction and they recruited to a size that are now catchable. And so if you look at all those blue streams are streams that we thought we had to be stocking as class two streams to actually get a trout fishery, but really they're way high. And if the, the, the lines that are on there, so each of these columns is a different stream in the watershed. 
the lines are um, a regional reference for um, the driftless area and then a statewide. And so for the, the statewide value, it's like 180. And for the, the regional, the driftless area, the, the average for a, for a class one stream is 200. Well, many of our streams were exceeding that in the, the yearling abundance. Um, and so we know a lot of those streams that we thought were class two, even without any stocking, are getting uh, enough trout from natural recruitment and coming into the watershed that we don't have to keep stocking. Um, the ones that are green on the right, those are those are brown trout as well, but those streams actually also have some pretty good brook trout populations in them as well. So we've been doing this um, throughout uh, all of our watersheds. And if you look at the reports uh, or you follow up and read some of the reports that I'm gonna show you at the end of, of the, the presentation, a lot of these graphs show this. And so you look at the average catch rate throughout the, the stream and then compare that to a regional catch rate. And if it's above it, we usually say, yeah, it's doing pretty well. If it's below it, yeah, well, maybe we still need to stock that, that, that individual stream. Um, so what is this meant for us? Um, and so the, these two graphs that I'm showing you here are the number of fish that our biologists have requested from our hatchery system. And so those are our quota requests. And if you look at the, the graph on the left, that's the brown trout numbers from 2012 to 2022. So including what we're gonna stock next year. And you see that that green line drops precipitously from about 160,000 requested fish down to almost zero now for small fingerling brown trout. We've been able to say, yeah, a lot of these streams don't need small brown trout fingerling stocking. It's not doing anything. So we just cut those, we cut those quotas. We also, if you look at the red line in that graph, the large fingerling, we have increased the large fingerling stocking in streams where the small fingerlings weren't working, but we know we still need to stock fish. So we've compensated and said, okay, we're not gonna just stock small fingerlings everywhere just to put them everywhere. We need to save that money and spend it elsewhere. But we have increased in places where the small fingerlings weren't working and the data said, yep, your population still needs to be stocked. So we've switched in, in those instances to a lot of large fingerlings. The right side graph here is the brook trout numbers over the same period of time. And, and you'll notice we have a, a, a lot fewer brook trout that we request from a hatchery. Uh, but those have been decreasing too, because we've been realizing that one, you can't stock brook trout and brown trout in the same watersheds because the brown trout outcompete. And two, we have to be really specific with where the places we're going to try to restore brook trout are uh, going forward in the future. But one thing I, I think we're, as a team, we're really proud of is that um, if you look at that brown trout graph, by reducing 130,000 requested, we're, we're saving ourselves $150,000 a year in stocking costs because the streams are doing it on their own. All the good work from the farmers doing best management practices on the land, uh, trout, you know, trout stamp projects, improving the habitat. Um, we've been really lucky with the amount of rainfall. Um, you know, the weather has changed and we've got more base flow in a lot of our streams and that's helped us a lot too. So um, natural reproduction and recruitment in the area has gone up significantly and we've been able to cut back and save money on stocking because of that. Um, so that's kind of how we do our assessments. And now I'm gonna switch to, to talk a little bit about how we do regulations. Um, in our area of the state, uh, the base regulation is an eight inch minimum length limit with a three bag. And that's on about 80% of the streams in Southwest Wisconsin. Um, we think, you know, eight inches makes sense because that's an adult trout. It gets it to two years of age and then they're, they're reproductive at that point. So we want to have them at least get to that size limit or to that size. And in a three bag, we know um, from doing some angler surveys, that people want a quality fishery. They don't want just to go out there and catch as many small fish as possible. People do want a quality fishery. And so we put a, a three bag on to limit some harvest as well as the eight inch minimum to get the fish up to at least two years of age before they're vulnerable to harvest. In some of our streams, we use um, some regulations to really try to improve the quality where we know that we can get uh, better um, size structure and, and, and more fish out of it. Um, and specifically the two regs that we use in our area to do this are um, a 12 inch minimum and a two bag. So in places where recruitment is low, so we don't have that many fish coming into the population, we raise the size limit to 12 and we lower the bag limit to two, just because we know we don't have 
as many fish in those systems, but usually in those systems, the fish grow really fast. And so we can get quality fisheries pretty quick in those systems. Uh, Castle Rock Creek is a good example of where the 12 and two works really well. Uh, the other side of that is in, in streams where we have a lot of natural recruitment, really a lot of fish come into the system. Um, and so there we've, we've, we've changed and we use a 12 maximum regulation where if people are going to harvest fish, we ask them to harvest smaller fish, less than 12 inches and put the ones bigger than 12 back. Because in these streams, we have high, high population abundance. So it's okay to harvest some fish. And actually we've switched on these streams to a five bag instead of a three bag too. This, I just noticed that it says three bag here, but it should be 12 max and five bag because we're, we're okay with harvest in these streams because there's so many fish. Um, and that's about 5% of the, the miles of those streams. Um, we have about 3% of our streams now where we're doing some brook trout management. And um, I'll talk more about those in a bit, but really it's, it's catch and release for brook trout, but the other trout, um, a five bag limit with no size limit because we want us we want those fish to be the, the target of harvest, but we want the brook trout put back. Uh, and then in some of our areas, we have some catch and release areas, especially places that have easy public access. But um, even two of those, um, Willow Creek uh, and Mill Creek, we we've switched now to the five max um, regulation to, to to offer up more opportunity for harvest because. Uh, we don't think the catch and release was really doing that much um, and there's a lot more opportunity now. So this is some of the data on the streams that we would look at. We get the data and we say, okay, you know, these are the streams that all have that 12 minimum with a two bag regulation. And if uh, I'll use Castle Rock as an example. So if it's right in the middle here and the numbers are by those size groups again. So if you look at it, when we shock, we only get 22 young of the year per mile on Castle Rock. So there's very little evidence of a large amount of, of uh, natural reproduction. Very few yearling fish, 34 per mile of yearling fish. But once they get up to the bigger sizes, they actually start growing pretty well. And on Castle Rock, for all adult fish, we have 271. And we have a really good proportion of, of fish that are bigger than 12 with 126. So streams where we have a modest amount of reproduction, we have not so much recruitment. We put on that 12 minimum and a two bag to try to get more fish into that yellow, that yellow bigger than 12 group. Now, if you look at this and you're like, well, why is that Leech Creek that's so blue on there? Yeah, so that one doesn't fit. And we probably need to look at that in the future as a stream where, okay, maybe this isn't the right regulation. But for most of these, we think we're hitting it right on, yep, it's low recruitment, it's got good growth. We wanna to try to get as many of those big fish into the 12 inches as we can using that regulation. Here's the opposite group of streams. So Crooked Creek, Big Green, Gordon, Mount Vernon, Camp Creek, Elk Creek. If you look at the numbers in that blue group, now the scale has changed here a bunch, right? The 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 access says zero to 3,500 now. And you know these places, big green, 337 young of the year per mile as opposed to the previous graph where it was 12 for Castle Rock or 20. Uh, 357 yearlings per mile, 974 adults per mile. These are the streams that we have real high abundance of trout. But notice that that yellow group at the top, even as isn't as big. And so we want that proportion of protected the 12 inch and bigger fish to, to really get bigger. So we want people to harvest on these streams, the smaller fish, and, and we wanna protect the quality size once it gets there. And so there are different biology in those streams, these high abundance, high recruitment streams versus the low uh, abundance, low recruitment, we do use different regulations. So we try to set the, the biological situation corresponds with the regulation. Um, brook trout protection and, re and, and restoration. So one of the things that we saw earlier is, is in that our brook trout numbers really seem to be slowly um, getting less and less and less. Um, and brook trout are the native trout in Wisconsin. Uh, brown trout, of course, were introduced from Europe and, and uh, they, we, we, we know brown trout are here to stay. They're naturalized, they're, they're fantastic um, sport fish. They're great trout. Um, but we do notice that, that there's some probably some competition between the, the introduced browns and our native brook trout and, and the brook trout seem to be slipping away a little bit. Um, 
here's that that graph again that says here's the average catch rate of those different size fish. So total less than uh, greater than four, greater than seven, greater than ten, um, which corresponds to the age group in brook trout. It's a little different than the brown trout. Uh, and this is on second order streams. So some of our smaller streams where you'd expect brook trout to be more so than our bigger streams. But we really see that the pattern is continuing loss of numbers over time. And it's worrisome, right? We want, we want those brook trout populations to be stable and healthy, just like the brown trout populations. Yeah, there can be some variability over time based on weather or climate events. But we think there's some, some real um, big things pushing the brook trout in the wrong direction. Um, one of those things is, is probably climate change. Um, and so this is a map um, that comes out of um, a master planning document for the driftless area. Um, and it looks at um, the sub watershed. So even those watersheds, those monitoring groups that I showed you, but these are even smaller. And then it rates the streams based on how resilient they are gonna to be to climate change. Um, so if the stream is black on this map, it's probably gonna be stable and the stream isn't gonna warm up. If the stream is orange, it's gonna be at risk. There's a, there's a risk that it's gonna to be too warm for brook trout. And if it's red, it, the, the, the models, the climate models predict that it's gonna to be too, too warm for brook trout and, and it's gonna be lost. And then the, each watershed is given a, a kind of a score, an A, B, C, or D, based on how resilient that watershed is. And you'll, and you'll look, and there's a couple of groups in here that I'm going to point out. And one is the Trout and Mill Creek watershed here in, in Iowa County. There's Lowry Creek, or this one's Lowry, and this is that Rush Creek system. And then this is the Otter Creek system. And so this this is the military ridge road here. And so the northern facing slope of the military ridge seems to have, whether it's its, it's northern facing trajectory, the watersheds, there seem to be more resilient to some of this climate warming. Where are the other places that we see the resilience? Up in the Baraboo Hills. So up by, Dev this is Devil's Lake State Park up here. So these watersheds up here, Otter Creek, uh, Parfries and Manly, um, these, these seem to have more resilient to climate change too. And part of that's the land use. Uh, this is the Dell Creek watershed up here. And then this is the Pine River watershed in Richland County. So those are the places that the models tell us the streams will probably stay cooler and be more resilient to the warming influences of climate. Pretty much everything that's south of the military ridge says it's too warm and is not gonna persist with climate change for brook, for brook trout. The brown trout numbers look a lot more favorable because brown trout um, are, they can handle warmer temperatures. Um, we're not really worried that climate change regime is gonna push brown trout out, but it is, looks like brook trout are, are at risk in Southern Wisconsin. So then another map that came out of that planning exercise was looking at the land use. So is it agricultural? Is it grassland? Is it forested? And again, we see some of these same watershed groups um, and, and probably the land use has also to do with the ground, the groundwater and, and the, the water temperature, but that the Lowry Creek watershed that, that's here, um, uh, Troughton Mill, Richland County, a lot more forested land, um, a lot less ag land. So th that land use stress, we know that good land use means it, it, more, it's more beneficial for brook trout as well. Um, another stressor that's on, you may have heard about is gill lice. Mm. So this is a real interesting one in that gill lice are a native parasite. They, they've been here, they've been here a while, but we seem to have the gill lice exploding and becoming more and more numerous in our brook trout populations. And this poor little fellow here, it, it's so numerous on his gills that basically they start to, to starve them of oxygen and their gills can't can't successfully get oxygen out of the water. And so the fish really, really get sick and stressed out. And, and Ash Creek in Richland County is a place where we used to have 2,400 trout per mile and now it's, they're barely hanging on. The, the brook trout are just disappearing and the gill lice infestations, horrible. And one of the, the our, our trout researcher, Matt Mitro thinks it, it's, it's 
approximate cause, meaning the ultimate thing that's really causing it is global warming and the streams are getting warmer. But because of that, the fish are becoming more susceptible to gill lice. Well, another thought we had is, is it because we don't have the right genetics? And did something change in our, our trout population's genetics that led them to be more susceptible to gill lice? And so we've actually done a lot of work with brook trout genetics over the past five, six years. Um, and what I'm showing you is, is a really confusing tree. And it's a tree with a lot of different brook trout populations on it. But we went out, we sampled the fish, we took a little piece of fin off of them and we ran the, the, the genetics at UW-Stevens Point. And this paper that's being published right now in the um, Transactions of the American Fishery Society by um, a PhD student at the University of Maine who worked with us and uh, he started at Stevens Point, but um, went to Maine basically says, okay, in the Mississippi drainage, so not the, not the streams that drain to Lake Michigan, not the streams that drain to Lake Superior, but the St. Croix and the Wisconsin River drainage and some of the other drainages, um, which is what, if you look at the, um, the different branches of the tree, there's different colors there. So the red color are streams that are in the Chippewa River. The blue ones are ones that are in the Wisconsin River drainage. The green branches are streams that are in the St. Croix River drainage. And these purple fuchsia one, the St. Croix Falls strain is a hatchery strain. Um, and then there's some other ones. Um, these light blues are ones that are in um, the uh, Black or Trempolo River. And so these are all streams that, but they grouped genetically into similar groups. And the groups that this, this A group are actually streams that all are very similar to Eastern hatcheries out in New York and New Hampshire. And it's like, well, where did these all come from? And surprisingly, one of those West Branch of the Mill Creek was a stream that we had used as broodstock for our hatcheries in the past. This B group, this, this second group, where did my cursor go? Right here, the, is, 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 is what we think is a native group that is the St. Croix River up, up north. Um, and they're pretty, pretty not, um, there's no hatchery influence there. They're all, they're all native fish and they're pretty grouped together tightly. So that group is like one that we really wanna protect and say, okay, those are native brook trout to the St. Croix River drainage. Let's make sure we don't mess that up. This C group, however, is streams, and they're all distributed throughout, that have high introgression of hatchery genetics. And that includes that St. Croix rivers. So those are our domestic brook trout that come out of the St. Croix and Osceola hatcheries. But some of our places that have great brook trout populations, like the South Fork of the Kinnikinnick River up north, those are basically domesticated brook trout that are out there on the landscape. They're, they're wild, they're, they're living in the streams, but their gene pattern says, no, they're, they're actually descendants from a, a, the Nashua, New Hampshire federal fish hatchery when we got fish from those guys back in the 80s. And so um, that C group is what we would call highly intergressed with, with, with domestic genetics or, or hatchery genetics. Then this D group are, stream, are some streams, and some of these are in our area, Story Creek, um, just south of Madison, P Pompey Pillar Creek in Iowa County, um, the Little Baraboo River, Hinkson Creek by Rowan Creek, they're populations that have a, a moderate amount of introgression. So there's some hanging on of the, the native genetics, but there's also a decent amount of domestic genetics, or these are kind of the mixed fish. E is streams that have just a little bit, and Lowry Creek is one of them with, that we've been using at the hatchery. But this, the exciting part is this F group at the bottom. Um, and these are streams that don't seem to have hatchery integration at all, very little hatchery genetics in them. And those are the streams that we're going to focus on for going out and taking um, eggs um, for the hatchery to, to repopulate our streams. And so this, this paper that's being published right now um, looks not only at the Midwest as a whole, but really focuses on this drainage in Wisconsin about where do we have remnant native genetics of Wisconsin fish, because we think fish that are actually native may be more resilient to things like gill lice or, or, or global warming than fish that were from out eastern hatcheries. So what does that mean for us in our area? And the red watersheds here that are highlighted on this map are the areas that we're really going to focus our brook trout restoration activities. 
that Baraboo Hills area up here in Sauk, Sauk and Columbia County. Uh, Hinkson Creek in Columbia County was one of them. Story Creek here in Dane County. Um, Trout Creek in, in Iowa County. Lowry Creek in Iowa County. The watershed above Black Hawk Lake in, in Otter Creek. Uh, Six Mile and, and Big Spring in the Blue River drainage. And then the Pine River system as a whole. These are the places that we have pretty good brook trout populations, native genetics, and we're gonna to try to really keep these brook trout on both with regulations. So in a lot of these areas, you might've seen that we've switched to a catch and release regulation on brook trout and a zero size limit in a five bag for, for all other trout in those streams. But we're, we're, we're using all of our tools to really try to help with, with our brook trout management. Um, habitat and property management. So you guys know that when you buy a trout stamp, hopefully that, that trout stamp dollars go into fixing stream habitat. Um, so what I'm going to try to do here is show you exactly what, how we spend your dollars. So there's been a lot of talk about, oh, people stop trout fishing. This graph shows the number of trout stamps bought through time. Uh, and really, yeah, there was a, a, was a downturn in the early 90s when we had that drought. Uh, but really, it's come back. And in the last three years, which aren't on here, uh, we've seen a lot more trout stamps sold. Trout stamps have gone up and up and up. So our revenue, which is good goes up and up. So we have about $1.6 million a, ye a year to spend on trout ha habitat. Uh, so where does that money go when your trout stamp dollars come into the Wisconsin DNR? So it supports about 11 full-time positions and those are all habitat biologists or habitat technicians or equipment operators that work throughout the states basically doing trout stamp um, habitat improvement. Um, in the Southern District, we have two and a half uh, full-time employees, um, and about half of an employee on my team gets supported through Trout Stamp. Um, statewide, um, after you take out the employee dollars that Trout Stamp supports, that's about $800,000, $865,000 a year that goes into actually doing habitat improvement projects on the ground. Uh, in our area, in Southern District, we get about $140,000 of that each year to spend on trout habitat improvement projects. Um, so where do, we, where do we spend the money? Well, first and foremost, it's got to have public access. So it's got to either be DNR owned property, um, owned property by the county or a village or a city, um, or a, an eased piece that a private landowner still owns, but we we bought an easement so that the public can use the land once we improve it. Um, we really try to work on streams that have um, impaired conditions. So, so is there something that's limiting reproduction or decreasing productivity? Um, is it a monotypic uniform habitat that we can switch into something that's gonna hold more adult fish or increase re recruitment? Um, so we take a stream that looks like this, which is kind of wide, shallow, and sandy. And we go in there and we put in un overhead cover, we add rock, we get the current moving, we scour the sediment out. Um, so we really try to get back to having uh, habitat that'll support trout. Um, but also we've been doing a lot of work in our area, especially to try to reconnect to the floodplain to help with some flooding issues as well. Um, so that's an example of what this is. This is Black Earth Creek just outside of Madison and a dam was removed. And not only did we improve the habitat, you can see some structures here, you know, some, some moving water, some riffles, but we, we, we connected the stream back to the, the, the floodplain so that in 2018, when we had massive floods in Black Earth Creek, it actually the habitat stayed put, it didn't wash out and, and the, the stream was more stable. And so we, we, we've gotten better at how we spend our habitat dollars to try to improve the stream habitat. Uh, the other thing we do with Trout Stamp actually is we do a lot of survey work. So this is a project um, uh, on Devil's Lake State Park actually, where there was a small stream that had some native uh, brook trout. Um, and we did, the, the valley walls were actually eroding and washing out. And we did a, a, a big project with Sauk County and they had, they got FEMA dollars actually for flood, flood mitigation. And we worked together with them on, on doing the, the stream stabilization, but then we came in after with, with trout stamp dollars and did the survey work and showed we did, we did help the brook trout population that was in there. So we can spend trout stamp on some limited survey work associated with habitat projects too. 
Um, current projects, um, if you've been up to Willow Creek in Richland County, we did a, a big, big project up there. Um, uh, and then we worked a little bit on Hefty Creek in Greene County. Dan, Dan Ole had a nice project that um, we were trying to do this fall, but we had some equipment issues and um, we were uh, struggling with our equipment and didn't quite get it all finished. Um, next year, we're gonna work a lot on Black Earth Creek uh, outside Madison. Um, a lot of older habitat projects have aged and um, the trout numbers have really gone down out there. And so we're gonna try to spruce up some of the overhead cover and tree drops to try to get Black Earth Creek numbers back up. And then three streams in Sauk and Columbia County, we've got some smaller projects on in Jennings Creek, Relke Creek and Manly Creek. Uh, Manly's a neat one right outside Devil's Lake State Park where um, it's actually got a, a special reg for brook trout because it's uh, just loaded with brook trout. It's got a nine max on Manly, but it's a neat spot to fish if you've, if you've never gone and fished there. Um, our properties and easements. So we, we do, we manage a lot of property. We know that a lot of, um, we, one, we have to have the, the property rights to be able to, do, to improve the habitat, but we know that a lot of people go fishing on, on these easements and, and properties. And so this is a map of our nine counties and mm -hmm. there, there's a couple things I'm gonna draw your attention to. One is, is those blue lines are all the streams where we have authority to purchase easement. We can't just go out and buy easement wherever we want. It has to actually be in a plan and approved by the Natural Resources Board for us to spend dollars on there. And so those blue streams are the, the, the approved areas where we can actually buy fishing easements um, if, if there is a willing landowner. The pink watersheds are the areas that we've decided to focus our outreach efforts. So we've mailed landowners postcards, we've mailed landowners letters, we've gone out, we've knocked on doors in those places. And those are the places that we've really focused our effort and we've done pretty well. The green smaller blocks are the, the fee title fishery areas where we own the, the, the land. We've realized that to get more and more places for people to fish, we have to focus more on easements and less on fee title, but we still know those fee title properties are important. Um, we had really good results when we, we, we cranked up our stream bank easement outreach um, starting in 2014 and the, that this graph shows by county the length of miles acquired. And so some of my retired former biologists, Kurt Welke and Gene Van Dyke, uh, really, really did an awesome, and Brad Sims too, really did an awesome job over those years to get almost 20 miles in our area of, of new easements um, out there on the landscape for people to fish. And easements are great because you also, I mean, the, it's still private land that the, the landowner is responsible for. So we don't have to take care of it all the time, but we can come in and do habitat work and the public has the right to fish, which is really, really fantastic. Um, we also couldn't have done it without partnerships like um, the Southern Wisconsin TU chapter would host uh, events for some of the landowners to get more information, talk about success stories. And so we had a really, really um, nice effort in the uh, Pecatonica watershed um, getting people out to these events and, and, and kind of talking about stream bank. And um, like I said, the Southern Wisconsin chapter of TU is really instrumental in, in helping to facilitate getting landowners coming there. And, and then the DNR could talk about the, the stream bank easement program. And we had 12 different negotiations going on because of those great events that they put on to, to get everyone understanding and, and talking as neighbors about how the stream bank easement program worked. So that was fantastic. Um, property management, um, this is getting probably a little bit uh, in the weeds for you guys, but um, you know we, we buy the properties, we ease them. Uh, Fisheries is the property manager, but we also rely on our park staff to help do things like if a road driveway culvert washes out, we need to do that. Or if a style needs to be put in, and I know your guys chapter and other chapters have helped us with work days putting in styles, but we also rely on our, our park and rec staff to help us do that. Trout Unlimited work days, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to do much without you guys. And so this is Steiner Branch uh, in Lafayette County, and there's a big chunk of willow that was choking out the stream. And so we had a work day and, and, and people came out and did brush removal and, and you get a lot more done on these work days because um, the energy and the passion from Trout Unlimited and, and our other stakeholders is fantastic. And so it's a cool drone shot of what the area looked like after this willow thicket that was kind of choking off the stream was removed. 
Um, the other thing, uh, we had the idea and, and Jerry and you guys were, were, were fantastic in leading this was, was having Trout Unlimited um, gift us some money to hire um, summer uh, limited term employees to do maintenance. And darn COVID, because uh, 2019, we actually had pretty good work out of a crew. And then summer of uh, 2020 and 2021, we, we just weren't able to hire staff um, to do it because of uh, the pandemic. And so we're hoping next summer to get back to it. Uh, but these basically are the two different work areas where we had all these different brushing projects, both for angler access and for stream habitat and vegetation maintenance planned. Um, but we're hoping to get back to that um, next summer. So last thing I'm going to talk about, uh, uh, and you guys have been great listening, and I, I'm about at my, my 45 minutes, or maybe I'm a little over, um, is the plans and reports that we generate um, as all part of this work and where you guys can find more information. Um, the first thing I want to bring forward is that last year, um, actually right as the pandemic was, was ending, um, uh, we published a, an inland trout management plan for Wisconsin as a whole. And so this sets out some really high, high level lofty goals about, you know, how are our hatcheries going to operate and where do we spend our trout stamp dollars? And, and so um, it, it doesn't get down to the nitty gritty, which streams are this and which streams are that. This is the, the over the long range 10 year plan for our whole program on how we're gonna, we're gonna manage trout. And so um, as a trout unlimited group that might wanna lobby or might wanna say, hey, we think you're spending your money in the wrong way and talk to our bureau director, this plan kind of lays it out. And so it, it's a good thing to, if you're, you're saying, well, what, really as a whole, what's the Wisconsin DNR doing? This inland trout management plan, it, it lays it out there really well. It's a well, really well-written document. And there's a lot of thought put into it. And I, um, like I said, Justin Hagland um, kind of finished it off after Joanna Griffin left her position. Uh, but, but, but both of those two individuals did a lot of work. Um, it can, you can, this be found on um, our website, um, and you know, just look for the inland trout management plan, and it'll it'll pop up. Um, the last thing I'll say is is as our team for each of these watershed assessments we do, we publish reports that are sharing the data, sharing the maps, um, sharing our recommendations, and and the the biologist analysis and 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 thoughtful consideration of. Are the regulations right? Do we need to stock more? Do we need to stop stocking? Should we reclassify certain streams that are class two into class one? Um, and these can be found on, if you again, go onto the DNR website and, and put in trout surveys and assessments and that search, it'll take you right to a, a page that's all throughout the whole state, but these are the ones that are in. And, and in the last two years, um, Knapp Creek, Willow Creek, the Grant River System, Bear Creek, um, and, and the uh, Aldo Leopold chapter did a great job with the Bear Creek system. Uh, and it, and that the data shows that it's really kind of responded well to all the work that Aldo Leopold chapter um, did. Uh, Sawmill Erickson uh, is a system in, in Greene County, uh, 2019 Black Earth Creek. Uh, Columbia County, um, that's kind of a collection of streams in Columbia County. It's not necessarily a watershed, but it's got Rowan Creek and Rocky Run and some other ones that are, are nice trout streams. And Nate Nye does a really nice job um, writing his reports are very readable. Um, the one that I've got a picture of on the, there is the Lower Wisconsin River tributary. So Crooked Creek, Big Green, Little Green, Millville. Um, Brad Sims did a really nice job with that report and, and lays out the current status as well as his recommendations moving forward. Uh, and then uh, Mill Creek. And then the only one that really got finished in for 2020 was the Baraboo Hills. And that's because um, we weren't allowed to use the stream barge because we had three people working together. And so we could only do backpack sites in 2020, but most of the trout streams in the Baraboo Hills are a little bit smaller. And so Nate and I and his crew still cranked out their watershed report um, just using backpack shockers. Um, but that's really the only one I think we'll have for 2020. But I know 2021, we got back on it and um, there's uh, five or six watersheds uh, that the, the guys are working on writing the reports on right now and hopefully they'll be out by March. Uh, and, and really, um, whether you're using them to plan your next fishing trip, whether you're using them to decide if you guys 
um, are interested in some habitat work. Uh, these these reports really lay out what what each of these watersheds and within them the trout streams that are contained within really um, need and and what the management recommendations are. So they're they're good and they're easy to read. We try to write them at a level that it's not just a technical document for a professional. It's good information and it and it's quality information, but it's written so that anyone can pick them up and read them. Hopefully. So with that, I'll, I'll say thanks for your time. Um, uh, hopefully I didn't bore anyone to death. Um, uh, I know everyone's probably thinking about, well, at least in Wisconsin, everyone's thinking about getting their orange out and going deer hunting. Um, but uh, even if thanks you're not for your deer hunting. What's that? I said, even if you're not going deer hunting, you should probably be wearing orange up there now. Some, yeah, that's true. Well, I have a question, Dave, on, on Knapp Creek. Yep. I you know there was a problem with it the other year. I'm just wondering how it's doing now. Um, well, I'm, I, I, the, so there's a report from 2018 on Knapp. Um, I, I think uh, we had um, region-wide really good reproduction really good recruitment. Um, a lot of the streams like Black Earth Creek was one that we were worried about the numbers are low, but all that rain we had in 2018 and 2019 may have ruined some reproduction, but I think the numbers are coming back in a lot of the streams. So I, I don't know specifically on NAP, but I'd, I'd suggest you give Justin Hagelin a call and, and say, hey, you know, how's NAP doing? Um, but okay. Nap's one where we, we see the brown trout becoming more and more prevalent and fewer brookies. Mm. Yeah, I think I caught one of my biggest brook trout out on that creek uh, a few years ago. Dave, I'm really, really glad to hear that uh, the habitat crew can come back this summer, we hope, and, and, and the prospect is good. Uh, I know, I think people don't realize how much they're going to be able to do. And I, we've, you know, several chapters have contributed to that uh, fund. And so I think they're probably pretty anxious to see them get out and, and work. And I know I am, but uh, it's great news that they're going to be back. And, and I really appreciate the, you know, your patience in getting this thing set up and over time i know we've uh, we've had some disappointments but uh, if we get a, a good year in i think they're going to see it's going to be worthwhile continuing on and contributing to each year yeah and I, I can tell you that with the money that we had budgeted from our the state side which was the match to what you guys were gifting um we've actually just been purchasing equipment so we've gotten uh, a utv and a covered trailer and some more some, so we've got more gear for the crew once we actually can get hire the crew. That's good. We have to get it hired yep. <laughs> and get them out there. Yeah, I, I know that was interesting when we when I did talk to the guys and and it was out one day when they were working. I got to run into them. So two years hiatus, we'll, we'll get it back. And I, I need some to keep it going. We need some buddy out there doing it one year so they they don't think i'm crazy when i come around asking for money for nothing right <laughs> that's good some other questions dave could i ask i guess it's a policy question in a way sure <clears throat> um last uh i mean the the lee wolf chapter spent a lot of time and money quite a few years ago on elk creek and did a great job. But the last time I was there, the upper part of the creek was pretty much unfishable because of a beaver dam that flooded the whole willow plain that was there. You couldn't, you just couldn't get up there. I have a vague memory that the DNR does nothing about beaver dams until after the end of the season when their offspring, you know, are out and then they blow up the dam but they don't do anything during the fishing season. Is that true? And is, is, do you know if anything will be done about 
beaver dams like the one that's there at Elk Creek? So I'll, I'll say a couple things about beaver. One is that I think the, the, the area you're talking about is actually part of a research project now from Matt Mitro and our research staff. Yes. And so there were selected streams where we said, okay, we're going to leave the beaver alone and we're going to follow the population of fish and see what the changes are. So there may be some impacts to fishability like you're talking about, but mm -hmm. we're really mostly interested in, does that really, because there are some papers from like the 70s and 80s that said, oh, it was really bad. The beaver silted everything in. And th there's some questions about in high gradient streams, is that true or is it just low gradient streams? And so Matt Mitro has put together this, this project where on a variety of different streams, we're going to allow beaver to recolonize follow the trout populations and see what the, the occurrence is. So, mm -hmm. so that's, that, I think that's what's happening on Elk Creek. But I, our general philosophy in our area, Southwest Wisconsin, which is much more developed than Northeast Wisconsin and Elkano County and the national forests up there. Our thinking is, is the beaver shouldn't be on our streams impounding things, but if they're in a spot that's on public land and offers a trapper, a recreational or an opportunity, and there isn't serious damage to somebody's driveway or a road or a farm field, we're going to leave that at least until March. So hoping a recreational trapper has an opportunity because it's public land for them too, right? Easements, that's not the case because on an easement, it's a private landowner. And we usually talk to the private landowner and say, okay, you want the beaver out or not. Um, but the other thing that we run into is that um, we have a contract with the federal US, uh, uh, US Department of Agriculture, Wildlife Services through APHIS. And our contract keeps getting more and more expensive and going less and less as far as, so we're in kind of negotiations with APHIS about how much beaver trapping we get. And so we're actually looking at maybe DNR technicians are going to start to do a little more beaver trapping on some of these areas. Because the other thing that's happened with beaver is the, the, the price of a beaver pelt is in the tank. Like nobody's trapping because you can't get, can't even get 20 bucks for a beaver pelt. And so it doesn't make it there. There's been less and less pressure from recreational trappers. And we do know that uh, we are having impacts on some of our streams and we want to get them out because it's different than up north, I think, uh, on, in our area. We don't want the farm fields flooded that are adjacent. We don't want driveways flooded. Um, but if it's on, let's say, the Black Earth Creek State Fishery Area or Trout Creek, if it's a public recreational opportunity for someone to come trap it, we're going to wait until March, until once the trapping season is over, and then we'll take it out. If it's in the middle of the summer, we'll probably address it. But things that show up at the end of the, like a lot of times, those young beaver will start to spread out in September and start to make new dams. We're going to leave those alone probably because if they're on public land where a recreational trapper could go get them. But I think the Elk Creek example you brought up is part of Matt Mitro's research project. Yes, it is. Um, Kurt, I was, I was all fired up to get our chapter to take that out. And I got the call from Matt. He said, don't do that. That's my research project. So, so thank goodness he got a hold of me before we did it. Yeah. Well, we even he and I sometimes cross our wires because we had a stocking truck with some. We have we have an experimental stocking of different age classes of our native brook trout that are going on top of these introgressed populations that have high proportion of hatchery genetics, and Ash Creek is one of them. Ash Creek, if you look at that genetic tree. The genetics are all domestic and they and it's like okay well we're going to stock native fish on top of those and then for six years and then we're going to come back and see what that did to the genetic profile can we can we fix those native genetics can we by stocking even though it's a naturally producing population can we get the right genes back in there and matt didn't read or didn't understand the proposal he, he had he had i had sent it to him and he was there doing a different survey. And it's like, you can't stock here. This is one of my project streams. And it's like, well, wait a second, Matt. So even, even we have our, our streams crossed once in a while. And uh, Dave, I, I was with uh, Duke Welter over on Mapledale this fall. 
uh, early fall, and we ran into a federal beaver beaver trapper. He, he that's all he does. He goes out and, and takes out beaver dams and and trap. Yep, trap that's so. Beaver. So that's the the contract we have with. It, 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 they're actually part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, um, and it's called Wildlife Services. And so those guys, they've got an interesting job. They remove nuisance beaver, they do deer damage, and they do things like wolf depredation. When wolves start doing things they shouldn't, they, these, that's what these guys do. They just deal with nuisance animals. Hmm. Yeah. I have, do I have another question? I have a quick question. I'm, I'm in Colorado. Um, have you had any, any issues with whirling disease? We had it for, I think it's kind of subsiding here now. So we don't have issues with whirling disease, mostly because inland waters in Wisconsin, we have just usually put and take rainbows. We don't have rainbow trout populations that are um, naturally producing. There's a couple streams in Wisconsin in the central part of the state but in the the southwest it's all brown and brook um in the great lakes they've they have had some whirling disease issues but we have really strict health practices um and so um not that i know of have we had whirling disease issues uh crop up like you guys have out west so our, our bigger like you know um VHS was a real health issue on the Great Lakes, and they had issues with that. And then um, on the Great Lakes, they also had uh, bacterial kidney disease (BKD) show up in the in the trout and salmon. Um, one thing that was really weird, we had show up at um, right after VHS. We did a lot more health testing of our fish. We had a cutthroat trout virus show up for two years at Nevin Hatchery. It never made the fish sick but the virus was present at the hatchery and then just disappeared. So we get um, some of our rainbows from Irwin, which is a, a federal hatchery, hatchery, I think in Montana. They get eggs from them. Uh, Dave, with uh, Black Earth going to have some work done this year, that's great. Uh, I'm wondering about the effects of the mud snails that are in there and not only there, how, how are they handling, how are the other streams handling the mud snails? What's the effect then? Great question. So really in the trout populations, we haven't noticed any impacts from the mud snails. Um, the, there's a, a young woman who is a water quality biologist. Her name's Kim Cooper. Um, and Kim was actually a technician on my staff. And then she promoted to the water quality biologist. Um, she's doing a master's degree actually through Colorado State University um, because her professor left UW-Madison and went out to Colorado State. But Kim's looking at um, those food web implications of what are the impacts to the native benthic macroinvertebrate communities, as well as what's going on with the trout. And interestingly enough, the trout eat a lot of them. She found a lot of mud snails in the trout stomachs as she sampled it this year. Hmm. And there's no effect on the trout with the digestion, no problem? Yep. We, and we haven't noticed any drop in the trout condition when we do our, uh, those trend sites that I've, I've told you that we monitor through time, the relative weight or the basically how fat they are compared to how long they are. That hasn't changed. The, the fish are still in good fitness in places where the, the snails are present. So, uh, you know, our streams are a little bit different than out west where some of those streams are pretty uh, low productivity, you know, mountain runoff, freestone streams. And our streams are really spring creaky, more nutrient rich. And I think that just they're not as they're not as limited in productivity as some of the western streams where they may have had impacts. So um, interestingly enough, on, on, especially on Black Earth Creek, it seems that the mud snail blew up and was super prevalent. And then in some of the spots, it's kind of disappeared. Hmm. Yeah. That, that's, that's interesting. That they're, 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 well, maybe they're eating out themselves out of house at home. <laughs> what Somebody. fly pattern do you use for those? A mud snail fly. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know, we have so many problems in the lake with the zebra mussels that just, uh, I thought there was going to be some kind of problem with the mud snails here in the, in the uh, creeks. I was really worried about that. But that's good news. That's good news. Somebody else have a question for Dave. Don't be shy. Dave, this isn't a question. Um, it's a couple of comments. This is Ashley from Colorado. And um, professionally, I'm a restoration ecologist and wetland scientist. So I really appreciate the discussion about beaver. We have a very different um, philosophy on beaver out here. You know, there's a really strong correlation between beaver complexes and um, healthy stream fisheries. And while I am a avid angler, I'm also a scientist and um, I'm pro beaver because it, it makes our streams healthier, makes fishing harder, but it puts fish in the stream or keeps fish in the stream. So it's interesting to hear the management of beaver out there. And I think you spoke to that correlation or that uh, the fact that our streams are just very different and they are nutrient poor and they're high mountain streams. And so we need to have a way to, you know, create those ponds and connect back to the floodplain and blah, 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 all the stuff that beaver do. Yep. Um, but I really wanted to say that I appreciate how thorough um, your uh, groundwork is and the field work and also your reporting you made you do make it really um, accessible to the general public and uh, it makes me wonder you know how how our uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife and DNR in general can do some make some improvements in that in that regard because I do um, you know, out here, people generally think, oh, catch and release, but they don't even realize why, you know, that those are the regulations on, on many of our streams, like why we do catch and release generally across the board or why certain select lakes or streams um, have, you know, certain species or you can bag certain species, but not others. There's not a, a, a general database or an, uh, an understanding by the public of why that is. And I think you really laid it out very nicely um, why certain drainages or watersheds or streams are regulated one way as opposed to another. I really appreciated that. So thank you. Good job. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I really like doing things like this where I get a chance to tell people that and explain it and have the back and forth because I think having uh, strong partners helps give us credibility and, and tell them why we do things and explaining um, means that next time that, you know, Jack or uh, Jerry or John are out on the stream and they, you know, some guys complaining about, you know, the DNR doesn't know what they're doing. They're like, well, actually, you know, there's this website, you can go get the report and kind of read it. And so. Yeah, exactly. And it's their money. So, yeah. you know, people want to know where their money is going. You talked about the trout tags and I think generally people want to know what the heck you guys are up to. Same here. And also go Rams. Woohoo! I'm glad the one woman that you mentioned on your team is now out here at CSU. <laughs> well, thank you. Anybody else? All right. Thank you very much, Dave. Thanks, and Dave. Really, really have appreciated what you did. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. And uh, we we hope we're seeing some better results from uh, post flooding things and the trout population. I, I'm loving the fact that uh, you, you're seeing the preliminary data coming in that the things are starting to come back very nicely and and that bodes well for what we're coming up with. I know, uh, and it was really good to see some of the streams that. Uh, how oh, the higher populations of the larger fish. I hope you guys caught those. But if you didn't, this is being recorded and you can come back and pick it up from the website in, in probably two or three weeks. Um, Mark will be having it posted on the website. So you can take a look at it if you, uh, you missed those. 
because those are very interesting streams. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's uh, one that I have told a few of you about that uh, it really has some large fish in it and consistently. So I got that from his lecture. Of course, I've been fishing that for a while, but I finally figured out I was missing them. I went to some bigger equipment and streamers and it worked out. So Dave, thank you much. We appreciate it so much and uh, good night to you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was nice talking with you and uh, enjoy uh, Wisconsin. If you come up for the deer season next week or this week. Yeah, you're headed out. I know. And say hello to Brad Sims and Justin Hagman both for me. I'll I know both of them pretty well. And right. uh, they're great people. So you've got a lot of good people out there. And we know it. Yep. And, and uh, this is, I guess, the last thing I'd say is if, if you have a question on something, call the biologists. They, they know it better than I do. They're out there collecting sure. the data and writing the reports. Sure. And so um, use our staff directory and find out who the biologist is for that area and, and give them up a call. They, we, we all love talking. I have a great team and they're all very approachable people. So they have been very helpful. Is that is that on the DNR website, Dave? Yep. Yep. Just go to the staff directory and then um, you can uh, by county just look for the fish biologist by the county that you're there, that you're going to fish in. OK, great. Thank All you right. Well, take care, for, you guys. Thank thanks you. For letting your, thank you very much. Thanks for letting your, your Western cousin sit in. I it was it was very interesting. I like fish in Colorado, too. I, Hopefully they're coming out for a visit. Uh, some of the people from West Denver chapter are going to come out and, and we're going to host them uh, this spring. So Good. we're going to bring in some more license money for you from Trout Sims. Wonderful. <laughs> all right. Good night, Dave. Thank you all. Bye. Okay. Uh, before we go, Ralph Lesser, you you're, say hello, Ralph. You joined a little bit late. There he is down there. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how well my sound is working here. Yeah, can but you that's we good. Can see a, an image there, uh, Ralph. Um, that we have John and we have Ashley from Colorado here on with us tonight. Ralph's going to be our coordinator um, for that uh, exchange trip. So I just wanted you to know and say hello, and and uh, he's going to do a good job. I'll get you in some nice places, uh, Ralph. I also wanted to tell you that uh, I have enlisted some help for you and scott lammers is going to uh, work on getting some of the restaurants uh and catering work uh set up for that trip so you okay. and scott will be working together he couldn't be on tonight i think he's off on a trip maybe deer hunting too or something but he couldn't make it so jerry i'm not sure whether my microphone is working or not can you hear me quite well yes oh okay very good then um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to our spring outings and especially the Colorado exchange thing. I'm sorry I wasn't on the, the beginning of the meeting here to say hi to everybody. I'm traveling down in Florida. Our son had surgery and uh, we're giving him a hand down here. So, um, but uh, I've already gotten a couple of emails about people who are interested in the exchange and uh, additional information on that and all the other outings will be forthcoming. Okay, great. Thanks, Ralph. And Thanks, Ralph. Others that you joined late uh, and didn't hear about the uh, announcement, we have a donation page set up on the website. Uh, if you're thinking about any year-end donation, you can do it on the website by a credit card. We're not having a meeting a banquet rather this this uh, December due to COVID. We're not going to meet in person. We are going to uh, ask that if you would like to make a year-end donation instead of going to the banquet, uh, we'd love it. We, we always need money and um, we are opening that up for, for donations. Uh, Al, did they uh, give you a final work word bill or anything on the porta potty situation i haven't received a final bill i get a monthly bill yeah okay yeah so, so, um, so they should have been out there october 15th i just thought about okay. that the other day all right was there supposed to be a final bill coming 
Um, there's no other than other than the October bill. No, there should okay. be no. All right. Yeah. All right. Yep. We did we did put a porta potty in that Castle Rock Creek, one of the creeks he mentioned this year. There's an experiment to see if we get some money back out of it. And I think we spent like six hundred plus dollars for the porta potty for that time. The season was open, and we think we got seventy five uh, in return funding. So, if we do it again, we're going to do it a little bit differently, uh, maybe with envelopes. We tried to doing it with the uh, donation page on your on your camera, and I don't think that worked out as well as maybe physically having envelopes available. So. We'll see how that goes next year. We'll talk about that later. A lock on the door, Jerry, and they don't get out until they donate. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's got to put, that has to play. That, that's put that man on the committee. I like that idea. <laughs> you know, and, and we called it pay as you go, so you know we'd warned them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll work out. Okay, uh, that's about it for tonight. Uh, fly time is, is pretty much set up and uh, we're going to start probably uh, just about mid-January, I think the way it looks now, uh, depending on the shoulder and how everything works out. But we do have, uh, we do have access to the um, Village Pizza again and on a Tuesday night. So oh. it, that's, that's gonna be good. I'll give you a final date in the mail, all your fly tires. And uh, I have a spot about for two more people. Uh, and Charlie, I haven't forgotten you. I will get that information to you. I don't know how you got skipped, but uh, we'll get you in on it. So that's about it for me tonight. It was a pleasure Hi. meeting uh, Ashley and John. I, I, hope, I look forward to seeing you in the springtime. And I hope uh, you're able to come out and visit us. Uh, there are some trout that are bigger than the eight inches he was talking about out there. We just have to show you the right stream. So anybody else have a comment, question before we close this thing up? No? Thank you so much. You're welcome, Ashley. Nice meeting you. Nice to meet you all. Okay. Thanks. All right. All right, right, take care all. all. Have a good uh, holiday. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.